So, schönen guten Abend. Ich möchte Sie recht herzlich begrüßen zu unserem heutigen Vortrag. Als Gastgeber möchte ich zwei Worte sprechen, wer Sie denn heute ähm, eingeladen hat. Das ist einmal die Bruno Stiftung, die Regionalfoto Rhein Neckar. Die Jordan Bruno Stiftung ist ein Bankerfit für Humanismus und Aufklärung. Wir treffen uns einmal im Monat in Mannheim, in Uland. Wer Interesse hat, uns das kennenzulernen, ist auch herzlich eingeladen. Weitere Gastgeber sind die Humanisten Baden-Württemberg und natürlich das ERI, wo wir uns hier befinden. Mr. Schörmann wird heute den Vortrag für uns halten. Er ist auf Tour hier in Deutschland mit seinen neuen Büchern, kommt jetzt gerade aus Köln und ich freue mich auf den Vortrag. Welcome, Mr. Schörmer. It's your time. Okay. Oh, I have to turn this on. Thank you. Sorry. I think he mentioned uh, that I'm coming from Cologne, I think, because uh, my wife is from Cologne, Germany. Now, I, I realize I don't have to tag that on for you guys, but in America, I have to explain where Germany is. You know, there's Europe, and it's sort of north of Africa. <laughs> and, <you> know, <laughs> And it's only getting better after 2016. <laughs> now I'm really happy to be here. This is my fourth uh, 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 talk event here in Germany. And then we, uh, we come here every year anyway to visit my wife's uh, friends and family. And uh, so it's nice to be able to, to uh, visit my atheist, humanist, skeptic, science friends uh, around the country. So uh, I thought tonight I, I would talk a little bit about uh, two of my books, mainly Heavens on Earth, which is my, my latest book. Um, and then I thought I'd say a little bit about uh, the moral arc, since that just came out in, in the German translation, and they have them here. So I'll tack that on toward the end uh, of the talk. And um, so the subtitle is The Scientific Search for Immortality, the Afterlife, and Utopia. But first, let me just give you a little bit of background about my day job. I am the publisher of, of Skeptic Magazine. It's the uh, quarterly publication of the Skeptic Society. We're a, a 501c3 nonprofit science education organization devoted to investigating claims of the paranormal pseudoscience, fringe groups, and cults, and claims of all kinds between good science, junk science, bad science, voodoo science, pathological science, non-science, and plain old nonsense. And unless you've been on Mars abducted by aliens, uh, you know there's a lot of nonsense out there. Uh, some people call us debunkers, but let's be honest, there's a lot of bunk that needs debunking, and that's what we do. Uh, so we, we uh, every issue of Skeptic, by the way, we're all online. You, you don't have to get the physical print magazine, although we still print magazines, print paper. You know, it's still it's still going. Uh, but we are also uh, online digitally uh, on all different platforms, and everyone has a particular theme to it. For example, uh, we did one on the future of intelligence. By the way, for you in the back, if you can't see the laser pointer, it's right there. <laughs> I don't know which one to use here, so just pick one, I guess. Uh, you know, are people getting smarter or dumber? Well, I'm from California, so I have an opinion about this. Uh, it doesn't look so good from where I sit. But, in fact, uh, people are getting smarter. The so-called Flynn effect, IQ scores are going up about three points every decade for the last century or so. So, you know, we're talking a standard deviation in half a century of intelligence going up. In abstract reasoning portions of the IQ test, uh, James Flynn discovered this effect. So people are getting smarter in, uh, in their uh, terms of ability to add reason, uh, abstract re reason abstractly, uh, which is encouraging. We did one on artificial intelligence. When will computers achieve human level intelligence? And we concluded that we're five years away and always will be. <laughs> it, it turns out it's a super hard problem. That, that's, you know, like 15 years ago we published that, that particular one. You know, is Scientology a cult? Depends what you mean by a cult. I think probably. I was amused that the Scientologists uh, wanted to become an official religion in Germany, which I didn't understand at the time back in the 90s when they did this, until I then understood the tax withholding system which the state then backs and, and, and gives money to churches that you are assigned to at birth and, or baptism or whatever it is. And uh, and then you have to opt out to stop the state from taking your money out of your paycheck, which I didn't realize that my wife explained this to me after she went down to the courthouse to uh, fill out the forms and pay a little fee 
to get them to quit taking money out of her paycheck to give to the Catholic Church. And she appropriately wore her T-shirt that said, uh, Dawkins, Janet, Harrison, Hitchens on it. And no one there understood that, of course. <laughs> that was pretty cool. Americans are quite shocked to hear this. You know, We don't uh, allow that sort of thing there, although churches get tax breaks, and so it's a little complicated. Was 9-11 a conspiracy? Well, yes, it was. Technically speaking, 19 members of Al-Qaeda plotting to fly planes in the buildings without telling us ahead of time constitutes a conspiracy. That's not what the 9-11 truthers think. They think it was an inside job by the Bush administration. This, by the way, they consider the most incompetent president we've ever had before, currently. Um, and, and yet somehow still managed to pull out the most sophisticated uh, conspiracy of all time. Most conspiracy theories like this are self-refuting in that sense. Um, the people doing it are, are completely incompetent, yet they still manage to pull out uh, some, something remarkable like that. So it depends on what you mean by conspiracy and how many elements have to be involved and so on. Uh, are you a global warming skeptic or are you skeptical of the global warming skeptics? <laughs> which would make you a believer. Which is a problematic word in science. You know, we don't say, well, I believe in global warming. It, it, it either is or it isn't. Or some probability assigned to it. Uh, something like that. And so that's a, a, a bit revealing about what we mean by the name skeptic. What, what does that even mean? It's not, it's not nihilism. It's not denialism. It's not just the gainsaying of anything anybody says. It depends on the particular claim. If there's a lot of evidence for it, Big Bang Theory, Evolution Theory, Germ Theory, and so on, we accept it as true, or at least true with a small t, you know, provisionally true, probably going to still be acceptable in years to come, unless there's counter evidence to it, you know, things like that. And so we can be reasonably confident that the world is getting warmer, and that it's primarily human-caused, and that we should probably do something about it, even if everybody doesn't agree on that. And that, that means we do not have to be skeptical of that, like we would some other claims. So skepticism is not um, a particular position you take all of the time. It depends on the particular claim. And, uh, and that's the kind of thing we, we try to teach uh, our readers as well as our, our youthful readers. We have Junior Skeptic Magazine for Kids, uh, in which we try to take down to middle school, young adult middle school, high school middle school kids, um, in which we teach critical thinking uh, there. Again, if you want to join the Skeptic Society, subscribe to the magazine, just go to skeptic.com. Tons of free content there as well. All right, let's talk about Heavens on Earth now. Um, I want to start with... A question for you. Where are you after you die? Well, we can answer that question with another question. Where were you before you were born? Now, I, I, I tried this out all the time, and the usual response is, huh? <laughs> or, what? I wasn't anywhere before I was born. Right. And that's where you're going. <laughs> Uh, now, this is uncomfortable, it's difficult for people to grasp this for several psychological reasons, not the least of which is we only have the experience of being alive, so you can't know what it's like to not be alive. It's like, imagine yourself dead. And you could do these thought experiments, you know, what do you see? You know, what, what, what do you see? Well, I, I, I picture myself there in the coffin, and my friends and family are there, and you know, hopefully they're grieving or something. Uh, but, but of course, you wouldn't see that. You wouldn't see anything. To, to, to imagine something, you have to be conscious, sentient, alive, and you're not. So you wouldn't imagine anything. Uh, there would just be nothing. That's really what it is. It's just nothing. It's like trying to imagine no universe. Go ahead and try it. I mean, so, so, so not, not just take, get rid of the earth and all the planets and the stars, the galaxies, all the dust and all that stuff and all the particles. You'd have to get rid of all of space and time. Th there just would be nothing, not, not even darkness. At some point, you can't even say it. It's, a, it's, a, it's a sort of a, it's like asking what was there before the Big Bang. It, 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 the time began with the Big, you can't even ask the question. So it's a little bit like that. So again, as I mentioned, the problem is, is we only have had the experience of living, so you can't imagine not being alive. So there is the 
beginnings of the belief in heaven. Um, now Epicurus wrote, therefore death, the most terrifying of evils, is nothing to us, since for the time when we are, death is not present. And for the time when death is present, we are not. Therefore, it is nothing either to the living or the dead, since it is not present for the former, and the latter are no longer. A more modern way of putting this by uh, Jorge Luis Borgia in his book, The Immortal. To be immortal is commonplace, except for man, all creatures are immortal, for they are ignorant of death. What is divine, terrible, incomprehensible is to know that one is mortal. I was thinking about this the other day when I was running with my dog on the beach. My dog's name is Hitch, named after the great Christopher Hitchens. And uh, so I take him to the beach every day. I live in Santa Barbara, and I throw the ball for him. And, you know, he just has this great life. He has no idea that it's going to come to an end. And it's like, I, I kind of sometimes wish I was my dog. I mean, the most exciting thing in the day for him is his ball. And then he gets to eat and then sleep. I mean, this is a great life. He has no idea about all this other stuff. And so in that sense, he's immortal. He, as far as he knows, he's going to live forever and has no concept at all. We appear to be the only species that is, has any idea about that. So between 50,000 BC and, and last year when I wrote the book, about 108 billion people were born. There are alive today around 7.5 billion. This makes the ratio of the dead to the living 14.4 to 1, which means that only 7% of everyone who ever lived is alive today. Of those 100.5 billion people who have come and gone, not one of them has returned to confirm the existence of an afterlife, at least not to the high evidentiary standards of science. I'll come back to near-death experiences where people think that they've gone there and come back. So, memento mori, remember that you have to die. Since the late 1990s, the Gallup polling group has consistently found that between 72 and 83 percent of Americans believe in heaven. Now we're more religious than, than Europeans, but interestingly, belief in the devil and hell trails belief in heaven by 20 to 25 percent, thereby confirming the over-optimism bias. There is a hell, there is a devil, and other people are going there, but not me. A 2011 Ipsos Reuter poll found that of 18,829 people surveyed across 23 countries, 51% said they were convinced that an afterlife exists. And the most curious survey I found was that a third of agnostics and atheists proclaim belief in an afterlife. Now you have to, you have to kind of look at these polls and remember that um, polling data is almost always self-report data, so we have no idea what somebody is thinking in their head when they read the question and they tick the box or that box. Um, and this particular one, when I looked it up, it was, I forget the exact wording, but it was something like, do you believe that consciousness continues after the death of your body? So there I could quite easily see somebody could be an atheist and think, well, yes, you know, I believe in this quantum consciousness. I heard this thing from Deepak Chopra about, you know, the spooky action in the distance and quantum fields and, you know, neurons firing, blah, and, you know, somehow I, it continues on. Okay. So I think a lot of people, maybe Buddhists of some kind, or Western Buddhists, or, or followers of, of people like Deepak Chopra, that think that consciousness continues. Uh, they, they're not religious. They may not even believe in a personal God. But somehow this idea is, is pretty prevalent. What are we talking about when we're talking about heaven? Now, let's set aside the, you know, the sort of the fringe elements of like the quantum consciousness people because they're not very common. Most people think of heaven as a physical part of the universe. It's a place where God resides. It's a place where the dead go to. Uh, but this is an evolving uh, subject. In fact, one of the interesting things in researching my book was to discover that heaven has a history to it. That is, it wasn't always the way we think of it today or that say the monotheisms think of heaven today, it evolved over millennia. Uh, and that, for example, the Hebrew word for heaven, Shyam, is sometimes rendered as the firmament or in the heavens above. I'll come back to this in a minute because the, the ancient Hebrews uh, had an evolving notion of heaven as a place to go. It, it wasn't always that way. Um, but if you think about their, their worldview, by the way, here's a nice rendering of it, um, of the ancient... Uh, Hebrew cosmology where you know the, uh, all this is super close by the moon and the sun are just up here 
It's a little bit like the flat earthers today. I don't know if you've ever seen the flat earth model, you know, but it's this flat table like this, and you have the, you know, the little moon and the, and the, and the sun are going around like this, and this, this is a canopy. It's, it's very ancient. Uh, idea that comes from this and you know there's these little holes in the canopy um, that the rain falls through and the stars are just up there in these crystal spheres and so on but if you think about it if you go outside in a in the desert where there's uh, not no clouds and, and not a lot of city lights it kind of looks like a canopy of stars like there's this crystal dome over us and we're just sitting on this flat earth because that's what it feels like and that's why most ancient peoples had this idea of this sort of canopy or, or body of stars above us. Um, this is from the Hebrew co uh, cosmology. And of course, this is what it really looks like. Um, you know, here's our galaxy and here's our sun. It's a rendering of our galaxy. Okay. <laughs> it's not a photograph of our galaxy. <laughs> and, and by the way, some, uh, I just was discussing this with my students uh, I teach freshmen, first year students, so they're young. And, and I ask them, what's wrong with this picture? It's a photograph of the Milky Way galaxy. Is that possible? Uh, yeah, no. Where's the photographer standing to take this picture? Okay. All right. But it's something like what it would be. So uh, of course the canopy, this you know, bar of stars here is, is when you're here looking this direction. If you're looking this way or this way, it's not you know, you're looking that way or whatever anyway. So. Uh, but it wasn't long there before in the history where this idea of ascending to, now there's much debate among psychologists and anthropologists about where we get this idea that you're going up. I think it's just obvious because that's where the stars are. That's the firmament. That's you know, kind of where we think of as, as, as where the sort of glorious stellar type things are. Uh, but this in, the, then in the Christian religion by the 12th century, as representing this ladder of divine ascent. The 30 rungs of the ladder represent the 30 stages of the aesthetic life, and the demons grappling the monks represent the many temptations of this life that might prevent one from reaching the next life with God and Jesus. Jesus is uh, up here on the upper uh, right, welcomes the monks who made it, while the angels in the upper left and the uh, monks in the bottom right here encourage the seekers to press on, and Satan here is swallowing a few monks that fell to temptations of the flesh or or whatever, that they didn't make it. A stairway to heaven, you might think of it that way. Or Dante's um, uh, Paradiso is the divine comedy, whoso laments that we must doff this garb of frail mortality and henceforth to live immortally above. Above he hath not seen the sweet refreshing of that heavenly shower. Uh, so a paradisiacal garden is what you might expect from the reveries of a desert-dwelling people where fresh water, ripe fruit, abundant crops, lush vegetation, dense herds of edible domesticated ungulates along with milk and honey and oil and wine were in short supply. Paradise, in fact, is derived from paradisia or walled garden and the envisioned New Jerusalem is a walled city. Although this, although this does lead one to wonder, why do you need walls in a perfect paradisiacal world? We know why people build walls to keep other people out. Unless it was in East Germany in the Berlin Wall, which is to keep people in, but that's unusual. <laughs> As described in the Hebrew Bible, if the Jews followed God's commandment, they would survive and flourish and be blessed with descendants and eventually be granted the land of Israel. The world to come, Olam Haba, is a reference to the anticipated establishment of a just and fair society here, not in the hereafter. Now this is important. Ancient Jews didn't believe you went anywhere after you died. You just went nowhere. So heaven on earth, the idea of heavens on earth, was here. We have to create a more just world now. This is the, this is the only time we have. In fact, Sheol, the underworld lacking any characteristics of this world, that, that's the, the word means this, not the hell of Christianity, which was bolted on later to the concept, but rather simply nothing, as in Ecclesiastes, for the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. See, there's that word, like, it's like, it's like the nothing, no thing, it's just nothing. Either have they any more a reward for the memory of them is forgotten. So there's no memory. It's not like you're lying in the grave thinking, you know, what's going to happen next. There's just nothing at all. Okay, who are the first people to realize this? Well, of course, we don't know. Thoughts don't fossilize. But we, we do have 
uh, ancient fossil remains, uh, for example, dated between 30,000 and 34,000 years old. This man was interred with 2,936 beads along with 20 pendants and 25 rings, all made of mammoth ivory, sewn into his clothing since disintegrated, leaving this remarkable scene. Now, if you're just throwing a body into a pit and covering it up because it stinks and it's rotting, you wouldn't do this. So a lot of archaeologists and paleoanthropologists think they must have, at least by this point, been thinking we're going to send you know, Uncle Og off to this other world or something or honor him in some way. Here's a 50,000-year-old Neanderthal skeleton intentionally buried at the La, che- La, che- La chapelle Sans site in southwestern France. The bones were buried in a depression that archaeologists conclude could only have been intentionally dug Tamphonic uh, analysis of the fossils indicate that they did not show cracks and weathering as was found in nearby bison and reindeer bones. Um, so again, intentional burying somewhere between, say, 100,000 and 50,000 years ago, somebody thought probably that we're going to bury them with some honors because they're going somewhere else. So maybe, you know, we just don't know. And we're probably not the only species to grieve. We know elephants grieve. There's a book called When Elephants Grieve, very moving uh, narrative of this. The animal behaviorist Karen McComb uh, wrote about this. Elephants may, though, uh, through tactile or olfactory cues, recognize tusks from individuals that have been familiar with, uh, that they've been familiar with in life. She actually, um, working on a reserve in Africa, ran experiments in which she would put different objects out there for the elephants, you know, in the middle of the night, and then they come out in the morning, and they're poking around there's some you know blocks of wood and there's some skeletons from other species and then there's some elephant skeletons then some elephant skulls and then some elephant tusks and the tusks got the most touching you know the most sensitive part of their pad they would touch it or smell it with their nose and so forth um and so again we don't know what there's what's going on in their heads obviously Uh, But I I don't think it's unreasonable to anthropomorphize a little bit in the sense that they're mammals, we're mammals. We certainly have base feelings and emotions about uh, grieving the loss of our loved ones, and surely other mammals do too. Uh, Whether they're thinking that, you know, their fellow elephants going off somewhere, you know, to some other life, probably not, but at least grieving is a part of it. What we've done is added another component, a soul. Uh, Dante, uh, this is um, William Blake's portrayal of this. Somewhere along the line, humans invented the idea that something floats off the brain, out of the body, in, and, and continues somewhere. Okay, why why do we do this? All right. So I'm going to explore a little bit for a few minutes here in the in the middle of the lecture on, on the kind of neural psychology uh, of uh, of this process. I call it in my in an earlier book the believing brain agenticity, the tendency to infuse patterns with meaning, intention, and agency, often invisible beings and from the top down. Uh, Soul, spirits, ghosts, gods, demons, angels, aliens, intelligent designers, government conspiracists, and all manner of invisible agents with power and intention are believed to haunt our world and control our lives. I think it explains uh, animism and polytheism and monotheism and it's you know related to dualism now dualism most people are familiar with i'm a monist monists believe that there's just brain there's no mind the mind is just a word we use to describe what the brain is doing but there's no mind up there that's just floating around off uh, separate from the synaptic connections and so forth um but 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 most people think that there is or they feel like there is in the same way that they think that there's both material and immaterial, corporeal and incorporeal, body and soul, brain and mind. Paul Bloom calls this a natural-born dualist. We know this starts at a very young age. We're young children. I mean, we're talking barely verbal kids. They're like three to four years old. And they're showing a little puppet show. Uh, So you have this little mouse that's running around, and this alligator puppet comes out and munches the mouse. And then you ask him, ask the child, where's the mouse? Oh, the mouse is, you know, he's dead, but, you know, now he's in this other place, and he misses his mommy, and he's scared, and he's thirsty, and so on. So little children think that the mouse still goes somewhere. 
nothing. You can see the little baby mouse is dead, but the mouse soul, the essence of the mouse-ness thing, goes off and lives somewhere else. And, and so we know this starts very early, and most of us can conceive of an idea of a mind and, and a soul that continues. Again, we can't conceive of not existing. <laughs> so, I mean, it's as fundamental as that. You cannot conceive of not existing. So, therefore, existence is the only thing we know. And the idea that it continues is just completely natural. Uh, and, uh, and it's almost like we think of the mind as like there's this little homunculus in there. Uh, Dan Dennett calls this the Cartesian theater. Um, like, you know, there's some little guy in there watching the stuff coming in from my senses projected on the screen. Uh, and, you know, how do I know my red, your red looks like my red, like my little homunculus can leap into your skull and look on your screen to see what your red looks like. Better. Okay. And this is why this is called the problem of other minds. You can't actually do any of this because we don't know that, that other people are conscious, sentient, experiencing things like us. So, you know, the, and this gets, just gets absurd with these thought experiments. I could be the only one on earth who's sentient and conscious and the rest of you are just zombies. And, uh, and, 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 and you would each think the same thing just as reasonably as me. Now, I, I get past all these, these um, kind of brain twisters that, that intro uh, philosophy students like to play with by just remembering the Copernican principle. You're not special. So the chances that you're the one and only sentient conscious being on Earth and everybody else is a zombie is ridiculous. Uh, and end of story. But anyway, that's, philosophers love their thought experiments. I prefer the neuroscientists like Wilder Penfield, who was one of the first to map the brain by actually going into uh, brains and tapping them with electrodes and asking the patient what they're experiencing. And the context is these are epileptic patients um, who are undergoing brain surgery to have the portion of the brain that is initiating the epileptic seizures zapped so they can stop them from spreading. And so you get permission before, can we wake you up after we you know, cut open your skull and all that stuff that doesn't feel good? Because the brain doesn't feel any pain. So you know, once we got you all you know, set up, we'll wake you up and then tap around there and ask you what you're experiencing. So this is what we, uh, that, that neuroscientists do to map the brain. It's a pretty good technique. So what he found was that if he touches certain areas here of the temporal lobe, which is sort of located here on the side and above your ears, uh, he can get patients to experience uh, deja vu, out-of-body experiences, trans and fugue states, feelings of being in the presence of others, hearing music, hearing angelic voices, intense meaningfulness, connected to a force greater than themselves, talking to God, deja vu experiences. Thank you. For giving <laughs> Just check and see if you're paying attention. <laughs> uh, deep stem temporal lobe stimulation of the amygdala and hippocampus of the limbic system produces feelings of intense meaningfulness, depersonalization, connection with God or the cosmos. So this gives us some insight into near-death and out-of-body experiences. The experiences that people have are very real. You know, the floating out of the body, the going through the tunnel, the white light at the end of the tunnel. There's some other existence or world on the other side. There's presences there, people we know, or religious figures or something like that. These are not that uncommon. Not everybody has them, but, you know, some not trivial two-digit figure of percentage of humans have these experiences when they have heart attacks or near drownings and things like that. Now, these can be replicated. This gentleman, Major General Dr. James Winery of the United States Air Force, discovered in training pilots by accelerating them in, in the centrifuge until they black out that a significant percentage of them have these, he called them dreamlets, but they were these kind of near-death, out-of-body experiences, of floating out of my body, the tunnel, the white light at the end of the tunnel, and so on. Now, and we know exactly what this is, hypoxia, it's oxygen deprivation. As the centrifuge is spinning, the blood is being forced to the center of the body in the center of the head. So the visual cortex, V1, for example, is shutting down. It's just the oxygen is being pushed away from it, and the neurons are shutting off in kind of a, 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 a system like that, as well as the blood in the retina is being pushed back and, and shunted in inward. So you're going to get some kind of spiraling or tunneling white light uh, at, at the end of the tunnel, that sort of thing. 
Uh, we know from another, this is um, an experiment, 2003, a German woman who had epileptic seizures who uh, had the same kind of brain surgery and they woke her up and tapped around in this little red area here of her temporal lobe and she was reporting floating up by the ceiling I'm, I'm up there now I'm looking down at you all and you know and then they would tap slightly to the left or right and then you know, not, now my right arm now my left arm now my right leg is floating up now my left leg is floating up and so on so they could map in the temporal lobe exactly which parts of the body were, were you know sort of floating out of the body and that sort of thing um, so we know that these things are, are quite common neurologically. A significant percentage of people have a sense presence effect. That is, when they're alone, they feel like there's somebody else in the room. Okay, again, I'm, what I'm building is a neuroscience of explaining the idea that there's a soul, that the soul continues on, that, that we have connections with some sort of afterlife or God or, or, or that sort of thing. Um, and... Uh, or, or ghosts are evidence of this, this sort of thing. So people uh, have these experiences. Alpinists and mountain climbers, for example, report uh, seeing these angelic figures or uh, talking to people. And it's not just high altitude because the Iditarod dog sled uh, racers have these experiences. They're by themselves for days on end. They don't sleep much. And they'll report like there's somebody sitting on the sled and I'm talking to this person. And this, these, these experiences go on for hours. Of course, there's nobody there, but the, it's, it's in the head. Solo sailors have this experience if you're there uh, out by yourself for a couple of days. Um, again, sleep deprivation, physical exhaustion will do it. Uh, Charles Lindbergh reported this in his flight from um, the United States to, to Paris. Again, this is only what, like 36 hours or something. I mean, every graduate student has gone that long without sleep uh, and had experiences. Um, the solo racers in Race Across America, which I did five times back in the 1980s as a bike racer. Uh, going across, uh, I once went 83 straight hours without sleep. I rode from the Santa Monica Pier all the way, uh, I don't know, right around here or so. At which point I was hallucinating being abducted by aliens uh, and just had this totally incredible, fantastic hallucination, drug-free and legal. Uh, which you can do now um, with sensory deprivation tanks. This is a big thing in California now. People put themselves, submerge themselves into these big tanks of warm salt water and they close the lid. Can't hear anything, can't see anything, can't feel anything. And you get some pretty cool hallucinations after some time. Your brain starts producing these things. I've done it with uh, Michael Persinger's God Helmet. So this is what he calls it, the God Helmet. There's solenoids on the side of the helmet to bombard your temporal lobes with these um, radio signals that uh, produces these kinds of weird, uh, uh, like out of body or sense presence experiences. In other words, all belief is mediated by the brain. And the mind is just a word for what the brain does. If a portion of the brain is lost, mind function associated with it is lost unless rewired. No neural structure, no mind function. So, like, for, now to be fair to, to the duelists, people like Deepak Chopra, who uh, is a friend, and I say, okay, Deepak, where does Aunt Millie's mind go when her brain dies of Alzheimer's? Because we know with Alzheimer's, neurons are just dying, and as the neurons die, the memories disappear. The memories are in the neurons. No neurons, no memories. Now, his answer is, well, they go back to the collective, you know, quantum conscious field out there where they were before she was born. Okay. You yeah. know. That's nice. Prove it. <laughs> How do you know this is well? The double slit experiment in physics. No, okay. <laughs> and this just kind of goes off the deep end that way. Um, but the other angle at it, like if you read the near death, let me just say a few words about some of the near death experience narrative stories, which are very compelling because they're usually written about people who have had a life changing experience. And I totally get that. Somebody who almost dies and, and doesn't feels like I've been given a second chance that I'm gonna do something special here. Okay, that's great. Uh, but they also report something else, like I went to this other place and it really exists. Okay, now two things. One, how can I tell the difference between that narrative account and, and other narrative accounts of people, my friends that have taken acid and other things back in the 70s, uh, and they sound just the same thing. Like, uh, say, my friend Sam Harris, who, who's take, taken ecstasy, and he writes about this in, in the opening pages of his book, um, uh, waking up that, you know, I took this and, and here's what happened. And to me, it sounds just like Eben Alexander's trip to heaven. Eben Alexander wrote this book, Proof of Heaven. Proof. When he was in a coma 
you know, his brain was swelling, so they put him in an induced coma. And he, you know, went to heaven and all these fantastic things, unbelievable colors. They were so rich and the sounds and, and, and I it felt just infinite love and so on. And Sam writes about the same thing. Oliver Sacks in his autobiography um, writes about when he was a medical student in the late 60s, he was taking all kinds of drugs just to stay awake to pull those 80, 100 hour weeks and the fantastic hallucinations he had. I can't tell the difference between those and the people that tell me about their near-death experiences. So now we get to, to the, an epistemological problem. How do you know what's true? Now, somebody that has the experience says, I was there, and it was unbelievable. I know it's real. Okay, that's nice. But how do I know it's not just in your head? Because that's where I think it is. It's only in your head. And they go, no, 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 no. I left my body. I saw it. I saw it. I looked down. There it was. And I'm off astral traveling somewhere. And, uh, okay. <laughs> How do I test this? How do I falsify it? Yeah, so, for example, Richard Dawkins and I have an invitation to go to Costa Rica for a week to do ayahuasca by somebody that runs the place that says, I know what they're hoping for. They're hoping Richard and I will go there and come back and go, oh my God, we are no longer atheists. We discovered there's this other place you can go to and it's fantastic. You know, it's this spirit world where there's all these entities and it's love and it's great. And Okay, but let's say we do that and that's what happens. I don't think that would happen, but, but maybe it would. And I come back and write one of my Scientific American columns and Richard's writes something in one of his books about, you know, we went there and it's absolutely true you would be completely justified in thinking we had lost our minds. Like, you guys just had a fantastic trip, and that's it. Nothing more in your head. Okay. At some point in science, we have to, uh, we, to ha for, for, uh, for reliable knowledge, there has to be a way for you to look at it, not experience it through taking drugs or something, but to actually see it and point to it and test it somehow. And, and, and if we can't do that, then it's, not reliable knowledge, so we can't say that there is an afterlife. So I conclude that there, the the default position is there is no afterlife. The null hypothesis in science is true until you prove otherwise. Now, as I tell Deepak, hey, look, if you're right, and you know we all wake up and there we are in this quantum state or whatever, great. <laughs> you know, maybe Carl Sagan will be there and Stephen Jay Gould, my friends, and oh, Hitch will be there. We'll be drinking whiskey. It'll be great <laughs> in this other world. I don't know. Uh, I doubt it, but, you know, I'm happy to be pleasantly surprised. But in the meantime, uh, we can't count on it. And that leads me to the core of the book, uh, which is uh, the attempt to, uh, for science to defeat um, uh, death. So I call this the after afterlives for atheists. These are the radical life extensionists, the transhumanists, the extropians, the cryonicists, the megapoint theorists, the singularity people, and the mind uploaders. Okay. So let me go through these. Uh, I understand you had uh, Aubrey de Grey here a couple of years ago. I, I really like Aubrey. He's a, certainly an interesting character. He wants to end aging. Okay, good. That's great. And the best part about it is he likes beer, and he thinks beer is the avenue to uh, defeating <laughs> death. So I'm like, okay, because I like beer. So if, it, if it, that turns out to be right, yay. <laughs> okay, but I doubt it, but, you know. Um, uh, but he thinks that it, it's just an engineering problem, and and he actually has the backing of some you know Silicon Valley dot com billionaires that are pouring money into this. To which I say, great, I hope you can do it. Um, but what's the it? Okay, because they envision that if you could just do these seven things that stop cells from um, aging, and then and, and then stop dividing. Uh, it, it, cells have this Hayflick limit: the number of times they can divide before they just die. Uh, and that certainly doesn't apply to like infants and little babies that just, you know, they just grow and they're strong and they get cut and they heal super fast. And so why can't our cells do that? Us non-infants here. <laughs> uh, and so the, well, the answer is ultimately um, evolutionary wise. Uh, natural selection only needs to get, to get its genes in the next generation. It only needs to really keep you alive for two generations worth of time. After that, you're just not really needed anymore. And because, you know, as maybe grandparents, you're useful. Beyond that, there's enough social support to get the infants into adulthood to reproduce and so on to keep the genetic line going. So 
evolution didn't design our cells to keep replicating indefinitely. So what he wants to do is figure out what that is, genetically engineer it, and do it. Okay. We're not even remotely close to doing any one of the seven, So, but okay, maybe if they make it, that, that'd be great. Uh, you know, and he says, you know, Shermer, don't you want to live to be 500 years old? It's like, I don't know. Maybe, but just get me to 100 without cancer and Alzheimer's and senility and lying in a bed with tubes and, and that sort of thing. You know, just solve one problem at a time. And then we'll see where we go from there. I'm not, a, I'm not of, the, uh, of the mind that a lot of people... It wouldn't be natural to live beyond X. And when you ask people this, there's surveys on this, how long would you like to live? The average is whatever the current average lifespan is. Most people now say, oh, I don't know, 80 seems about right. Okay, this is totally bogus. They don't believe it for a second. And I know because if you say, okay, tomorrow is your day. You're turning 80. It's over. Would you like another week? Yeah, I'd like one more week, please. Thank you. How about another month? I'll take another month. Okay, so we fast forward to the month. Okay, tomorrow... You know, I got a few more things I'd like to do. Okay, how about another year? I'll take another year, and of course, this would continue on. Assuming you're healthy and cognitively aware and not suffering. All right. So, um, okay, so where are we on this scientifically? Not even remotely close. None of us in this room are going are gonna to make it. Um, so that leads to the extropians who want to defeat entropy. Uh, th these are all kind of related if you can't do that, you can be chronically frozen, um, it, which is where um, you are put in one of these big tanks. This is Alcor, which is in Arizona, which is really hot most of the year and not a good place to keep chronically frozen tanks if the electricity goes out. And, uh, but nevertheless, the idea is that uh, we'll freeze you and then, and then reanimate you later. Uh, and then cure whatever ails you. Okay, now first of all, have you ever seen like a can of defrosted strawberries that are kind of mushy because the cells have all shattered? Okay, so now they know about this and so that they know the people that were frozen decades ago, they'll never be brought back. Their brains are just mush, will be mush. Uh, so now they inject you with this, um, this cryopreservation agent, kind of an antifreeze that keeps the cells from shattering. Uh, but as far as I can tell, they're unable to do this throughout the entire brain, uh, mainly for two reasons. One, it's technically very difficult to do, and it, it's very time-consuming. And as far as the state is concerned, cryonics is a form, it's illegal to do to somebody alive because it would be considered murder. So you have to do it when they're dead. Okay, so right off the bat, you are being frozen for posterity on the worst day of your life. And now we're going to carry you forward. Okay, oh, we're going to fix all that with nanobots and all this stuff. Yeah, okay, maybe. Uh, but for, for now, it doesn't look like preserving the connectome of your brain. That is, the entire synaptic connections of all of your neurons and synaptic connections that represents your memories, yourself. Um, this is the Omega Point Theory, Frank Tipler's book, uh, the physics of immortality. We're going to live forever. Here's, again, here's that metaphor of the stairway to heaven or the ladder to heaven. Um, modern cosmology, God, and the resurrection of the dead. Okay, so uh, Frank's idea is that in the far future, there'll be enough computing power to create a virtual reality indistinguishable from this reality. Now, you're probably aware there are people that think this has already happened and we are living in a matrix. Again, yeah, very skeptical of this idea, although it's fun as science fiction. Um, but that in the far future, we'll be able to do this and resurrect everyone who ever lived or even could have lived. So you'd have to have a computer, the power of 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 183. So that's a one followed by 10 to the 183 zeros. Anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty big number. The universe would have to uh, collapse on itself to generate enough energy to produce this computer, Frank says. And when he wrote this book, that was before we discovered that the universe is expanding at an accelerating rate. It's not collapsing. So, so much for Frank's theory. But it's, it's, it's an interesting concept I'll come back to in, in just a little bit with the idea of the singularity, which is a Ray Kurzweil idea the singularity is near and that we're going to uh, upload our minds into a computer. So we did an issue of this, uploading your brain. Is it scientifically possible? No, it isn't. 
<laughs> not just now, but there's there's another problem with it. And I'll I'll come to that problem by uh, telling you about experiences I had going out to this um, cryogenic place in uh, Southern California, uh, in which they were freezing uh, rabbit brains at minus 125 degrees. After they had put a rabbit on that little surgical table, they wouldn't let me take a picture of the rabbit. Okay, um, but the rabbit's alive, and so they anesthetize it or just put it to sleep. But it's still alive. And then they shave the neck and they, they find the carotid arteries and they cut them open and they put two tubes in there and they pump that cryopreservation uh, chemical, that uh, antifreeze, into the brain. Because the problem with the cryonics people is they can't get the antifreeze into the deep parts of the brain before it freezes or starts to rot after death. So the, the, the memories are going to go. They're going to be gone if you wake the person up. So there's no point in being resurrected if you're not aware of even who you are, right? So you have to be intact as a person. So they, anyway, the idea of this rabbit experiment, to get the antifreeze in there, saturated through the brain, freeze the brain, which they did. And now here I am looking at the microscope through these electron microscope uh, images of, there's the frozen rabbit brain, here's the defrosted rabbit brain after a day with the goo uh, from the antifreeze stuff. And then they slice it in these little micro slices and then photograph it. And these are individual neurons with their individual little synaptic connections between each other. So that's a tiny little cube of neuronal tissue with its synaptic connections, which are still intact. So their argument is that the memories would still be there. And so now you have to follow this reasoning because it sounds completely crazy. They scan the pictures, <laughs> and now you digitize the synaptic connections, and you have a big file. The claim is, we now have this rabbit's memories, or if we did it to you, we would have your memories in a digital file, and then upload it into the cloud, and there you are. Now I'm standing there going, but, 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 but the rabbit is dead, right? <laughs> oh yeah, he's dead. He's not coming back. It's like... Okay, how is he coming back to life again? Well, we're going to scan him, and then he's going to be in the cloud. It's like, no, he's not going. He's dead. He's there. I can see him. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay. This is the problem of identity, uh, which I think is the deepest flaw of all this. Not just the technological problems, but who are you? Okay, so their argument is that you are your memory self, your mem self. You are your connectome. That is, you are the collection of all your memories. And if we could have that in a file, scan it, and then upload it in the cloud like Johnny Depp in Transcendent Man, and turn it on, he's in the computer there or wherever, and he's looking at the little camera all in here. Um, okay, I think this is flawed because you're more than just your mem self. You're also your point of view self. That is, from moment to moment, you are looking out through your eyes, and there's a continuity of consciousness from one moment to the next throughout your life. Now, it's broken up periodically by sleep every night, but it doesn't completely go away. You have your dreams and so on. You can interrupt it with general anesthesia, where there's no dreams. Uh, but it comes back. As long as it comes back, so the chronic people, if they can pull it off, and be a continuity with a bigger gap than sleep or general anesthesia, but, but there'd still be a continuity. That might work. But the transporter problem, you're probably familiar with this in, in philosophy of mind, thought experiments. You know. When Captain Kirk goes to you know, Planet Vega, who's there? I mean, is it a copy of Captain Kirk and the original is here on the Enterprise they have to destroy that and then that's the original and then he beams back and they destroy that one and this is now the original. Or are there just multiple copies all over the place? Or are they actually moving his atoms across space? All right, It's the same kind of problem that religious people have. When you go to heaven to be with Jesus or whoever, whichever your religion is, what's up there? So now, I mean, the Jews dealt with this early on. Well, the body's in the grave. It's rotting. So if the body was physically resurrected into heaven with God, then, then it would be gone out of the ground, right? Well, no, the, the God copies the atoms. Well, well wait a minute. If, so he copies the atoms. You're still going to get cancer and all that and aging. Oh, no, he's going to fix all that. Okay. Well, but that's not you. It, it's a copy of you that's better, but it's not you because you are all the other stuff too right which i write about 
Julia Sweeney's monologue, Letting Go of God. Julia Sweeney was a comedian for Saturday Night Live. She wrote a beautiful monologue that she performs. You can watch on YouTube. Where she talks about the, YouTube, the uh, Mormon boys coming to her house in Hollywood. And they're pitching the Mormon story, you know, like it's a Hollywood script, you know, like this is going to be a great movie. You're going to love it. And you should join our, our, our religion. And, you know, this, and the angel Moroni and came to America and all this crazy stuff. Gold plates found in Palmyra, New York, and Joseph Smith's backyard. And, and, and it just goes on and on. And then they get to the part where um, they go, go, and then you get to go to heaven. And you get to spend eternity with your family. And she's like, oh, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> that doesn't sound good to me. And then it's like, you know, and then the blind will, sh will see again and the deaf will hear again and the, and, and the handicapped will be made whole again. So Julia had cancer. And so she said, well, I had uterine cancer. And so I, I they took my uterus out. Do I get my uterus back? <laughs> you can imagine these 18-year-old boys in their starch white shirts with their bicycles going. <laughs> What's a uterus again? <laughs> uh, yeah, you get your uterus back. He goes, I don't want it back. Well, you know, and then what if you had a nose job and you liked it? Do you have to get your old nose job, back, your old nose back in heaven? All right, so in, in other words, the, the idea of transporting the actual body to heaven, what would that even mean? I mean, you would just be a flawed physical being again. That's not perfection. And if, if, if you're different, so you don't age and so on, that's not you. Okay, no, 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 so Christian sex, say, oh, by the way, one Christian sex, uh, because you asked the question, how old are you when you're in heaven? So they decided you're 30. You know, it's a good year, that's the age Jesus was when he was resurrected, and so on. I was like, well, I'm 64, so what happened to the 34 years in between? Because that's also part of me, my memories that are physically encoded in my connectome and so on. What happened to those? Because that's part of me. And because if it's just the soul, the pattern of information, your connectome that floats off the brain, it's up there somewhere in the cloud or whatever. Uh, but the memories aren't fixed. It's not like a snapshot of your memories is you. The memories are fluid and always changing. There is no you. That's the illusion of the you. It's an illusion. There's no you. As if a single entity represents you. It's a constant flowing, changing state. So this is really just fraught with problems, not just for the singularity sci-fi people, but for religious people, um, there's no good answer to this question. So if there is no heaven above or heaven on earth, what then? As Hitch wrote in Vanity Fair when he was dying of cancer, to the dumb question, why me, the cosmos barely bothers to return the reply, why not? As he wrote, it will happen to all of us that at some point you get tapped on the shoulder and told not just that the party's over, but that the party is going to go on and you have to leave. That's the reflection, I think, that most upsets people about their demise. All right, then, let's pretend the opposite. Instead, you'll get tapped on the shoulder and told, there's great news. The party's going on forever, and you can't leave. So, so here again, we have with this Im immortality. This is, this is a crazy idea. You don't want to live forever. The party is going to get super boring after you know, a couple hours not to mention a few thousand years. Um, you know, as Hitch described, the Christian heaven is be like celestial North Korea. <laughs> you got this dictator that knows everything you're thinking and doing. No, no, this would not be good. Not be good. Okay. So facing death and life with courage, awareness, and honesty can bring out the best in us and focus our minds on what matters most, gratitude and love. <clears throat> gratitude for a chance at life given the biological reality that those hundred billion people who lived before us were in fact only a tiny fraction of the many trillions of people who could have been born but were not. The chance encounter of sperm and egg that led to each of us could just as well have produced someone else and you would never know it because there would be no you to know. Once born we are each unique, a concatenation of genes and brains with thoughts, feelings, memories, histories, and points of view that can never be duplicated here or the hereafter. Our sentience, yours, mine, everyone's, is ours alone and like no other anywhere in the cosmos. We are given this one chance to live some four score trips around the sun, a brief but glorious moment in the cosmic drama unfolding on this provisional proscenium. Given all we know about the universe and the laws of nature, that is the most any of us can reasonably hope for. And as I close the book out, fortunately it's enough. It is the soul of life. It is heaven 
on earth. And so let me just then kind of wrap it up and, and say a few things about that are kind of more, this is not the happiest subject in the world, <laughs> uh, about our future, I think, going forward. This idea of going to the stars, I think, is going to happen. Uh, not in the afterlife, but in our own life with, with struggle. So let's talk about that for a moment. I'm just going to lecture just for a few minutes about the final chapter of the moral arc, which uh, I titled Protopia. Because there's no such thing as utopia, and the attempts to achieve utopia leads to dystopia. So we have to uh, uh, strive for ut- protopia, just incremental steps of progress, one day at a time. And I start with Shermer's last law, because no one should name a law after themselves, so this is the last <laughs> I'll ever do from one of my Scientific American columns. Any sufficiently advanced extraterrestrial intelligence or far future humanity is indistinguishable from God. I got this idea from Arthur C. Clarke's famous three laws. Of course, the first, when a distinguished but elderly scientist states that something is possible, he's almost certainly right. When he states that something is impossible, he's very probably wrong. Two, the only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture a little way past them into the impossible. And three, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Take something, for example, by the way, this was the theme of 2001. Um... Take something like telepathy. Now, we skeptics debunk uh, psychics and astrologers and mind readers and so forth, people that talk to the dead. But by the way, anybody can talk to the dead. It's getting the dead to talk back. That's the hard part. (laughs) Now, we know that real magic or real telepathy or mind reading is not possible. But but technologically speaking, this has already happened. Uh, This is a gentleman who is a quadriplegic who learned uh, to control a cursor on a computer by they put a, a little computer chip, uh, barely the size of a penny, in it, the motor cortex of his brain that controls his hands, his arms and hands. And, 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 and so he was able to move things. And now he's got to the point where he can actually reach out with a dummy um, arm and, and pick up a cup and take a drink and things like that, just by thinking the thought. Eventually, these electrodes would become microscopic, allowing us to control our environment just by thinking about it. Just imagine you just walk into your house and think, Beethoven's Ninth, and then, and then it comes on. Or I'd like it to be, you know, 72 degrees, or whatever it would be, 21 degrees, or whatever that would be, <laughs> uh, in my house. And then it just happens. Your house just picks up the signals coming from the chip in your brain. Now, now to an outsider doesn't know about the technology, that would look like telepathy. Ooh, like this guy's a witch. He's, you know, he's got these supernatural powers, but it's not. We may be, be able to download any website into our contact lens through wireless internet access through brain chips controlled just by thinking access to all knowledge being available. Uh, that would be a kind of technological omniscience. So let's make a quick comparison between biological evolution that is relatively slow over the course of billions of years since bacteria, hundreds of millions of years since complex life, 35 million years since primates, 7 million years since hominids, 3 million years since bipedalism, 1.5 million years since tool use, and 100,000 years since Homo sapiens, compared to cultural evolution, which happens very rapidly, 10,000 years since the agricultural revolution, 5,000 years since writing, 500 years since the printing press, 200 years since the industrial revolution, 66 years from the Wright brothers to the moon, 15 years from ARPANET to the World Wide Web. In other words, I think Ray is probably right about something like a singularity coming, that is, these accelerating exponential growth curves. This is the famous Moore's Law, of course, the uh, computing power per thousand dollars of of computer that you can buy has been accelerating um, uh, since really the 1950s when Gordon Moore first articulated this, but as Ray points out in his book, there's you know this uh, the reason this happens is for many other exponential growth curves like the decrease in transistor size, the increase in uh, magnetic data storage, increase in random access memory, the decrease in the size of computers, the decrease in the size of mechanical devices of all kinds, mass use of inventions. Um, actually, I was thinking about peak you know the concept of peak oil there's peak stuff that i think we've passed peak stuff i was thinking about this uh your when we were in that record store with all that with that stacks and stacks of vinyl records and then stacks and stacks of cds 
And now you just have it all in your phone. You don't have to have any of that stuff. It's less stuff, I think, because it just got smaller and smaller and just digitized. Or the internet, explosive use of the internet, the cost of DNA sequencing, human genes mapped per year, uh, constant U.S. GDP and constant dollars going up at an accelerated rate per capita, U.S. GDP and constant dollars were getting richer and so on. In other words, all of this could lead to us becoming a type one civilization, then type two, then type three, and so on. This will get us to this indistinguishable from God argument. So we are now currently a type zero uh, civilization, tribal civilization using dead plants and animals, fossil fuels as our primary energy source. A type one, this Russian astronomer articulated this. Type one civilization is a planetary civilization, controls the energy of the entire planet. It's about 100 years into our future. That renewable energy. Type two, stellar civilization, controls the energy of an entire star, which is about 1,000 years into the future. And a type three civilization, a galactic civilization that controls the energy of an entire galaxy, anywhere from 100,000 to a million years into our future. So there's Kardashev and his type one, two, and three civilizations. Carl Sagan had estimated that we're at about 0.7 on the scale now, which is you know, when, he, when he made that calculation right around here, we're just barely like right around right there now we're you know kind of approaching point seven so we got a ways to go maybe 2250 or so before we become a type one civilization but when we do then we can expand out and start colonizing the solar system build a sphere around the sun to capture all of its energy into a dyson sphere that gives us essentially unlimited energy then we can expand and colonize the entire galaxy become a type three civilization which is immortal because not individuals but the species is immortal because we can they can survive the death of their home star a type 3 civilization has harnessed all the stars of a galaxy like the empire of star wars or the borg a type 3 civilization may be able to create atom smashers of galactic size to open gateways through space and time a type 3 civilization may even be able to create a baby universe through stellar engineering causing the star to collapse into a black hole that gives birth to a new universe now, I know we're, we're off into, into wacky science fiction land here, but if you read um, Michio Kaku's books where he speculates, he's a physicist, he's, this is you know, an engineering problem. Okay. Or a type four civilization where you get the energy from the entire universe using both dark matter and dark energy. Or even a type 5.0 civilization energy from all the universes that are out there. Okay, now this is completely, uh, uh, totally speculative. No evidence that they even exist. But what would you call an entity being capable of creating life, planets, stars, and universes? If you don't know the technology, you call it God. If we know the technology, we call it extraterrestrial intelligences or far future humans. And that brings us back to the end here. This is the end now of the moral arc, uh, which was inspired by Dr. King's famous speech in which he talked about the arc of the moral universe bending toward justice. Each of us is two selves. The great burden of life is to always try to keep that higher self in command. And every time that a lower self acts up and tells us to do wrong, let us allow that higher self to tell us that we were made for the stars, created for the everlasting, born for eternity. He was a Baptist preacher and I'm an atheist, but we are, in fact, made from the stars. Our atoms were forged in the interiors of ancient stars that ended their lives in spectacular paroxysms of supernova explosions that dispersed those atoms into space, where they coalesced into new solar systems with planets, life, and sentient beings capable of such sublime knowledge and moral wisdom. We are stardust. We are golden. We are billion-year-old carbon. And morality is something that carbon atoms can embody given a billion years of evolution, and that's the moral arc. Thank you.